So, ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to the final act of this uh, Ideas Lab. And it's my great pleasure to announce the academic lecture by Barry Eichengreen, a very distinguished professor from the University of California at Berkeley. I have known uh, Barry for a long time, maybe almost 30 years. He contributed enormously also to the discussion about monetary union uh, when we discussed how to actually whether one should create a monetary union first and then how to set up the institutions that would govern uh, the, the common currency. And I was just discussing with him that at the time his comparative work, uh, Europe, United States was particularly helpful, insightful, and I think had a lot of influence uh, here in Europe. But maybe we drew some conclusions which were too hasty because one of the key issues at the time seemed to be that in the United States you had convergence of income across, of, across states of the United States and that you had an exceptionally high degree of labor mobility. That's the way the world appeared in the mid to early 1990s. Today we know that convergence actually started to slow down and stop at exactly that point and labor mobility in the United States started to fall. So viewed as of today, maybe the difference the United States and Europe is no longer that big and though fundamental. At the time, the overriding issue was really, what do we do about inflation and how can we get currencies under control within Europe and in the end, the conclusion was the best way is to go forward and create a common currency, the euro. Now, today we have a, a different concern, and I think it has resonated throughout many of the panels which we have had here, which is encapsulated in the world populism. And uh, that is why uh, we asked Barry to uh, give the lecture this year because he has just published a book which I already mentioned earlier, The Populist Temptation, Economic Grievance and Political Reaction in the Modern Era. Um, he will explain to us what he means by the modern era, but I take it it will not be the last 20 years, but perhaps the last 200 years. And I'm certain that we can learn again uh, from his historical insights and with these words, Barry, would you please come up here? Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Daniel, for the kind, kind introduction, uh, including the cautionary words about drawing comparisons between the United States and Europe. Uh, I will talk heavily this afternoon about the United States with uh, implications for Europe, so those are important caveats to bear in mind. Uh, I thank you also, uh, Daniel, for, for the plug for my new book. Uh, uh, you, you're responsible in a way for the contents of this lecture as well for, uh, in ways that I will describe Writing a book is uh, an exhausting task. It's a major undertaking. In my case, it, it, it takes a, a period of years out of my uh, intellectual and emotional life. I only end up writing one when I'm upset and confused about something. Uh, upset so that it galvanizes and, and holds my attention and confused, so I feel like I have to understand it better, which I, I tend to do by writing about it. So my previous book, which was entitled Hall of Mirrors, was on the global financial crisis. As a student of financial crises, I believed that I understood that we collectively understood what caused them and that we as a, uh, as a society had learned enough about those causes to prevent another crisis 
as serious as the Great Depression of the 1930s. So when that turned out not to be exactly true, I felt compelled to write a book as a way of channeling my anger about the inadequacy of the policy response and understanding the phenomenon better. More recently, the, the Brexit referendum, Donald Trump's election in the United States, the rise of populist parties and leaders in, in other countries, uh, especially here in Europe, were sufficiently disconcerting and perplexing that I felt compelled to write another book. So today, with prompting from uh, Daniel, I will adopt a different perspective. I will start by observing that there are occasions when populist parties, movements, and leaders can have a positive effect on the economic, social, and political order. I made this assertion to uh, Daniel here in, in, in Brussels, I think it was about three months ago when we were sharing a, a couple of glasses of beer. When he put me on the program today, uh, he challenged me to develop the idea. So I will um, uh, take that dangerous approach. I'll start with some examples from the history of my own country, the United States, that illustrate the point and then I will attempt to identify the circumstances uh, under which um, such positive uh, effects are likely to materialize. Since I'm a social scientist, I should start by defining terms. My own preferred definition of, of populism is uh, as a political movement with anti-elite, authoritarian, and anti-other tendencies because populist movements combine these three tendencies in, in, in different ways. There are different variants uh, of the phenomenon. I should also make explicit my maintained hypothesis. There is a debate uh, in the literature about whether populist movements are mainly animated by economic grievances, economic insecurity in particular, or identity politics, uh, perceived challenges to national and personal identity. I uh, firmly refuse to take a position on that question. My view elaborated in, in, in the book is that such movements are, are almost uh, everywhere and always animated by a combination of the two concerns. Although, uh, as a university professor, I suppose that I'm a card-carrying member of the elite. It's the authoritarian and anti-other strands uh, of populism that I find most troubling. Um, to be sure, there may be occasions when the circumstances of a country are so dire that it needs a strong leader with authoritarian tendencies to create a sense of national unity and right the, the ship. So the argument would go, uh, South Korea needed Park Chung-hee because it was the poorest country on the planet in 1960 and because it faced an exis existential threat from the north. But Park was a relatively benign dictator. Uh, I suppose everything is relative in this sphere. In particular, uh, he did not pursue the other defining policies of a, uh, uh, of a populist politician. He did not uh, pursue populism's characteristic economic policies, for example, which involve unsustainable budget deficits, chronic high inflation, redistribution toward one's cronies. If you're a close student of, uh, of, of the Korean financial crisis of 1972, or if you're uh, conversant in the early history of corporations like Samsung, you might dispute the generality of this conclusion, but I think it's a fair statement overall. Then there's the tendency of, uh, of populists to divide society in, into the people, on the one hand, and others. In Donald Trump's America, others is code for foreigners, racial and re religious minorities, feminists, LGBT individuals, all whose growing visibility and assertiveness is perceived as a threat to the economic, social, and political standing of, of, of the traditionally dominant grouping, where in this context, traditionally dominant grouping means middle-aged white men. Um, Trump's antagonism toward uh, 
darker-skinned people who speak Spanish is well known, but in addition to that, I can't help but observe that support in Trump, for Trump in 2016 was then and remains today partly a reaction against feminism and the perceived threat it poses to the economic, social, and political standing of middle-aged white men. Yes, Trump attracted a surprising number of votes from older white women. Not, not all of the latter, of course, are exactly feminists, and, and Trump's rallies and tweets in which he disparages the physical appearance and mental capacity of women like Hillary Clinton, Maxine Waters, and others makes clear that this hostility toward feminism is not incidental. Rather, it's an essential element of his persona, and it's integral to his political base. Um, some will argue that positive things can come out of the nativist strand of populism. For example, that it forced um, mainstream political parties in Europe to come up with policies to better regulate the flow of immigrants and, and refugees. Perhaps, but it's impossible to justify political movements that um, seek to regulate the flows of immigrants and refugees by legitimizing and institutionalizing discrimination against people of a different nationality, religion, or color. Given all that, uh, if populism is a political movement with uh, anti-elite, authoritarian, and nativist tendencies, then it follows by process of elimination that constructive, positive results are most likely to flow from populist movements and parties that emphasize the anti-elite element. Um, this focus on, on, on the constructive elements uh, of populist movements that emphasize anti-elite sentiment makes intuitive sense in that one can well imagine circumstances in which elites of, uh, uh, of various types can influence the political process in ways that favor their own interests relative to those of society as a whole. If you have a little knowledge of history or you know how campaign finance works in the United States, you don't have to imagine how this could, could occur. You can readily see the evidence. So the question I want to ask is, under what circumstances uh, uh, a budding populist movement can change this uh, political status quo for the better? Let me give you some examples now um, from the history of my own country where this happened, and then discuss, then speculate about the circumstances that made it possible. The classic populist movement in the United States was in the late 19th century. I should be clear, I think, about uh, terminology at this point. Uh, populism is always and everywhere a, a revolt against the elites, but in the context of U.S. history, the populist revolt, where the two words populist and revolt, re revolt are both capitalized, was a, a, a late 19th century political movement that culminated in the creation of the People's Party, also known as the Populist Party, in the 1890s. So the term populist revolt comes from a classic 1940 book by John D. Hicks, a professor of history at the University of California at Berkeley. The populist revolt, again, uh, both words in caps, was fundamentally an agrarian movement, uh, a movement of farmers, a movement mainly of wheat farmers reacting against economic insecurity. They were reacting against the commercialization of agriculture, which meant that prices were now determined on, on world markets and fluctuated for reasons they couldn't control or didn't even understand. They were disturbed by the unpredictability of climatic conditions, which increased the variability of their yields and created the risk of catastrophic crop failure. They complained about deflation uh, since crop prices declined with deflation, but the costs uh, uh, of repaying their fixed-term mortgages did not. They complained about the high interest rates on those mortgages charged by banks that faced little competitive pressure. They complained about the tariff, which favored import-competing industry over 
uh, export-oriented agriculture. They complained about the tobacco buying monopoly that was James Duke's uh, American Tobacco Company. At least that gave us uh, Duke University. They complained about the extortionate freight rates that the railways uh, charged to bring their crops to market. They complained about the plutocrats, the, uh, the one percent railway barons like uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt and, and, and Leland Stanford who profited at their expense and who, in, in keeping with my theme, gave us Vanderbilt University and Stanford University. Uh, the disaffected farmers formed first the Grange and then the Farmers Alliance and finally the People's Party. They uh, attempted to form an alliance with urban industrial workers and they nominated the uh, populist firebrand William Jennings Bryan as their party standard bearer in 1896. What did the farmers and their allies get at the end of the day? Surprisingly, perhaps they got quite a lot, much of it positive. They got the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887 to regulate rail ra railroad rates and ensure that these were, quote, reasonable and just. They got consistent weather and precipitation data from the National Weather Bureau starting in 1895. They got the Sherman Antitrust Act in 1890 and a Federal Bureau of Corporations to study and report on monopolistic practices more generally. They got the Smith-Lever Act of 1914, which established the Cooperative Extension Service in which federal, state, and local uh, county governments operating through state colleges provided farmers with practical information on cultivation, crop insurance, other relevant measures. They got the Gold Standard Act of 1900, which lowered capital requirements for uh, banks in small towns and rural areas whose uh, residents had been complaining about inadequate bank competition. They got a federal income tax on top earners in 1913, which addressed their concerns with income inequality and rendered the government less dependent on uh, uh, import tariffs for revenue uh, on the import tariffs that they found so objectionable. In 1913, they got the Federal Reserve Act, which was designed to prevent seasonal spikes in interest rates to, quote, provide an elastic currency and limit the deflation that had so troubled the farmers. So William Jennings Bryan, no less, called the Federal Reserve Act, quote, a triumph uh, uh, for the people. Calling all these changes positive is controversial, perhaps. There was dispute then and there continues to be dispute today about the uh, of effectiveness uh, of uh, Interstate Commerce Commission regulation and about whether the re resulting freight rates were reasonable uh, and just. While the worst of the monopolies, Standard Oil, was broken up in 1911, it took decades before uh, the United States developed an effective antitrust or competition policy. And while uh, average tariff rates, import duties as a share of uh, total imports fell sharply after the adoption of the federal uh, income tax in 1913 and, and remained lower over the subsequent period, that wasn't enough to prevent the Congress from uh, raising tariffs in 1922 and 1930, not back up to 19th century levels, but significantly. Still, I think uh, this was a large amount of reform targeted directly at the farmers' concerns, all adopted in relatively short order. In addition, there was political reform. So everything I've described to this point was economic reform. In addition, there was political reform intended to address the populists' concerns about elite capture and corruption. State legislatures in the 19th century were widely seen as uh, hotbeds of corruption, as captured by powerful special interests and therefore unresponsive to voters. The U.S. Senate was the target of these same accusations because in the 19th century, senators were not elected. They were appointed to the upper house of the U.S. Congress by state uh, legislatures. Uh, the framers of the U.S. Constitution back in eight, 1787 were members of the elite. 
you know, they were the landed uh, interests. They believed that members of, of the upper house should be appointed rather than, than elected because they thought senators should be entrusted to make policy freed from the pressures of popular opinion. But over time, political machines gained control of state legislatures and uh, the senators elected with, with the support of those state legislatures and political machines were uh, dismissed a, 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 as puppets. And finally then, uh, the rise of the populist party created uh, additional pressure for motivation for making the Senate uh, more directly accountable to the people. The first step in uh, addressing these concerns uh, then was the adoption of referendum systems in states like California and Oregon, which allowed voters to uh, circumvent corrupt and unresponsive state legislatures and, and, to vote, and vote directly on important policy questions. Uh, in Oregon, there was a politician, William si Simon Uren, who became known uh, predictably as Referendum Uren, who mobilized the Farmers Alliance, again, uh, uh, elements of this populist movement, and, and, and allied them with labor unions to create a, a direct legislation league. Uh, direct democracy uh, can, of course, be something of a mixed blessing since voters are freed of principal agent problems, but they're not always in a position to make informed decisions. This is something that uh, we are reminded of in California every two years when we see the results uh, of uh, the very long ballot th that the voters are, are presented with as a result of these very early 20th century constitutional changes where we vote on everything and, and, and anything uh, directly, uh, it, it's again a, 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 a problem of which our Brit British friends were reminded in 2016. But I think direct democracy has its merits when agency problems resulting in political corruption and capture are relatively severe. A second s step in this political process was civil service reform. Uh, designed to, to ensure the appointment and to reward federal government employees on the basis of their competence, their performance, rather than uh, on, on the basis of patronage. Uh, civil service reforms that outlawed what had previously been mandatory campaign contributions by public employees to uh, local political leaders or, or, or the local political machine. There were uh, similar reforms uh, at the city level uh, during the uh, so-called progressive era from the 1890s through World War I. In addition, there were changes in state constitutions and finally an amendment to the uh, federal constitution in 1913 to provide for that direct election of senators. Again, a step in the direction of direct democracy not unlike arguments today in Europe to provide for direct election of the members of the European Commission, an argument that I make uh, in my book. Finally, there was the spread of direct primaries uh, in which voters rather than politicians nominated by party leaders to attend national conventions selected presidential uh, candidates. So all of those were uh, political changes set on foot by the populist revolt of uh, the previous three or four decades. Bringing me to the question, why did this movement succeed in achieving at least some of its goals? Part of the answer, in my view, is that presidential elections in, in, in the two or so decades ending in the key realigning election in 1896 were very closely fought. Political competition was intense. Uh, both major parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, therefore had an incentive to adopt flanks of the populists' platform in an effort to tip voters uh, in their direction. The Democrats went furthest, nominating Bryan as their candidate in, in uh, 1896, when he was simultaneously the, uh, the candidate of the populist party and of the Democratic party. In the end, this did them a little good. The Republican candidate, William McKinley, won largely as a result of an improving economy. But the Republicans, too, uh, embraced many of the planks of the populists' 
platform. They didn't go as far as eliminating the tariff or going off the gold standard as Brian had uh, advocated. But they, they, they did uh, adopt and implement related measures like the Gold Standard Act of 1900, the Federal Reserve Act, and the National Income Tax, uh, all of which went some way toward uh, uh, addressing the populists' underlying concerns. At the same time, uh, given, given the structure of the um, U.S. electoral system, it was hard for the uh, insurgent third party, the People's Party, to make headway, uh, and that in turn gave the major parties more scope for gaining votes by adopting some elements of the populists' platform. Another progressive, progressive era reform, and here maybe I should put reform in quotes, was to give state legislatures the power to decide who was qualified to be on the ballot, supposedly as a way of keeping unscru unscrupulous, corrupt, candidates out of the running, this had unintended consequences. Uh, Republican and Democrat-controlled legislatures gave themselves automatic lines on the ballot while instituting onerous petitioning requirements for upstarts. Uh, a, a third party wanting to get on the ballot had to get a certain number of, of signatures in uh, each and, and, and every state. Uh, those petitioning requirements persist to the present day. They, in fact, constitute a more powerful barrier to third parties, fourth parties, fifth parties in the United States than the country's first-past-the-post electoral system. For example, it may uh, already be too late for Howard Schultz, the um, CEO of Starbucks, to run, as, uh, run for president as a third-party candidate in 2020 because of the impossibility of getting on the ballot in all 50 states starting um, from here. And, and it's worth remembering in that con context that the populist party had a presidential candidate in 1896 only in a plurality of states, not in uh, all of them. The consequence of that was that the, the, the populist party could not take over from the Democrats in the same way that the Republicans had taken over from the Whigs, their predecessor in the 1860s. But this also meant that uh, the left-wing vote was not splintered between the Democrat Party and the People's Party, ensuring that both would be out of power. Instead, it led to the fusion of the Democrats and the, and, and the populists, which in turn uh, gave the Republicans a strong incentive to compete which encouraged them to sympathetically incorporate elements of the populist platform uh, into their agenda. From this historical episode, I, I draw the conclusion that intense political competition and close-fought elections, which give mainstream parties an incentive to, to adopt positive elements of the populist platform in order to uh, attract swing voters, and an electoral system that erects hurdles to the uh, electoral success to the entry of um, fringe parties with populist characteristics increase the likelihood of mainstream uh, of the mainstream incorporating some elements of uh, incorporating some of the constructive elements of the populist uh, agenda. Um, to be sure, there are no uh, guarantees here. Sometimes political parties faced with close-fought elections, seek to appeal to their base in order to maximize turnout rather than appealing to the swing voter. And as we've learned, uh, been reminded recently, no electoral system guarantees protection from uh, fringe parties and politicians. So the, uh, the French two-round uh, uh, election system was, was portrayed as a mechanism for limiting the threat from fringe parties insofar as voters were expected to, to unify behind the mainstream candidate in the second round, but then we temporarily had the, uh, the specter, the possibility of, of um, Mélenchon uh, and, and Le Pen being the two finalists. Similarly, uh, my understanding of the, of the Italian uh, electoral reform, giving bonus seats to the party with the largest plurality was 
uh, seen as a way of favoring the mainstream parties, where in the most recent election it, it had the opposite effect. Still, I think there's some general validity uh, to the conclusion um, that uh, the structure of the electoral system and the intensity of political competition are uh, both important for channeling populist uh, uh, pressures in positive directions. But we also need to ask, uh, why were the less savory elements of the populist revolt not also adopted? And the answer here is that they were. Uh, the Grange, uh, the first of these agrarian movements, was dominated by old immigrant stock from Scandinavia and Britain, uh, who were less than welcoming to new immigrants from southern and eastern Europe. In the West, where the populist revolt was centered, there was visible hostility to, to Chinese and Japanese uh, immigration. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 coincided with the rise of populism. William Jennings Bryan himself was not hostile to foreigners uh, overall, but he was visibly hostile to the Chinese. Uh, this period also saw, uh, in addition to the Chinese Exclusion Act, the so-called gen gentlemen's agreement with Japan, under which the Japanese government uh, vol volunteered not to issue passports to citizens who expressed the intention of immigrating to the United States. And then in the U.S., we got the uh, Immigration Act of 1924, which keyed immigrant quotas to 1890 uh, immigrant shares in the population, in other words, to population shares before much of the new immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe, precisely in order to discriminate against uh, immigrants from those sources. So. Um, the positive effects of this populist revolt were mixed in with some significant negatives. For, for those uh, who hope for some, uh, uh, something positive from populism, I think the message is be careful what you ask for from populist movements, uh, whether of the left or the right. My second other relevant episode in, in U.S. history I will uh, touch on more briefly, that's the, uh, the 1930s. The Great Depression, uh, with an unemployment rate in the United States of 25%, was of course uh, fertile ground for populism. There was uh, Huey Long, uh, the governor and senator from Louisiana, who spoke to contemporary concerns about unemployment, uh, economic inequality, and insecurity with a uh, share the wealth campaign in which he essentially proposed confiscating the assets of the wealthy and giving everyone a, a universal basic, basic income. So Long himself was not a savory uh, character. He spouted uh, classic populist rhetoric. He was uncouth. He railed against the newspapers for publishing fake news. Um, he was preparing to challenge uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt for the presidency, uh, although he was assassinated in 1935. He was supported by the likes of Father Charles Coughlin, a radio preacher of the Rush Limbaugh uh, variety, who railed against bankers and spouted anti-Semitic rhetoric. But given the extent of economic uh, distress, dislocation, insecurity uh, in this period, the striking thing is that these individuals and others like them did not seize the reins of power in the United States in the 1930s. The question is, why not? I think the immediate answer is, again, that the Democratic Party co-opted key elements of the populist uh, agenda. It was able to form a, what was called the New, New Deal Coalition of Trade Unionists, Ethnic, Religious, and Racial Minorities, Jews, Catholics, and blacks and white Southerners uh, to push through programs like unemployment insurance, a minimum wage, and Social Security. I think it's revealing that uh, the name for old age pensions, publicly provided old age pensions in the United States is Social Security. It wasn't called the Social Security Act in the 1930s for nothing. That was a, a, a direct response to widespread concern about economic insecurity. Again, 
I would argue that there was a role in this outcome for the electoral system, which made it hard for third-party candidates like the socialist Norman Thomas to make headway, uh, at the same time providing space for uh, the mainstream parties to attract voters sympathetic to the platforms of third-party candidates, uh, uh, which essentially meant adopting elements of what you in Europe would call social democratic policies. In addition, uh, there had been uh, a shift over time, as I noted earlier, toward direct primaries in which uh, voters, rather than party leaders, picked the candidate to run, uh, who would run in elections. The old system had prevented insurgent candidates with populist leanings uh, who were not long associated with the party from gaining the nomination, forcing such individuals to run as ultimately unsuccessful third-party candidates. Now this was no longer the case. Voters deeply dissatisfied with the status quo could now uh, go to the polls to nominate candidates whose views were uh, more in line with their own. So not just the policies, but also the candidates could be co-opted, if you will, by the mainstream parties. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was not exactly one of these insurgent candidates. He was very much uh, uh, a member of the elite but he also displayed certain quasi or proto-populist characteristics, and he adopted uh, populist strategies. He made the most of his personal and political charisma. One of the standard definitions of a populist politician is a charismatic leader. He understood and, 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 and addressed voters' fears uh, of economic uh, insecurity, recall his famous fireside chats about how there is nothing to fear but fear itself. And, and like other, other populists, he used new media, radio in this case, to get his uh, message out to the people. He attacked concentrated industrial and financial power, and he used his attacks on concentrated industrial and financial power to establish his anti-elite credentials most famous in a uh, 1936 speech uh, accepting for a second time uh, the Democratic Party uh, nomination in, in which he volunteered that business and finance were, quote, unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. Uh, he was a singularly effective uh, political operator as a, uh, a master of the art of the deal. Maybe we, I should call him a, a master of the art of the new deal. Um, he was able to build an, uh, an effective coalition of workers, minorities, and white Southerners to push through constructive reforms uh, addressing concerns about inequality and insecurity, uh, concerns that, had they been left unaddressed, would have otherwise fueled a populist revolt. Again, I would be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge uh, some unsavory aspects of 1930s politics. There was the Mexican repatriation, the mass deportation as of as many, many as two million Mexicans, not only Mexicans, but Mexican-Americans, birthright uh, U.S. citizens uh, who spoke Spanish from border states like California and Texas. Ostensi uh, ostensibly motivated by the fact, by the belief that these uh, illegals competed with unemployed natives for, um, for jobs. Uh, there were also the uh, unsavory consequences of including Southern whites in the New Deal coalition. Southern whites could be attracted in part because they understood that as a relatively poor part of the country, the South stood to be a net recipient of outlays uh, under the new programs. But in order to retain their support, uh, FDR and other members of his coalition had to cater to their political and racial preferences. So programs like unemployment insurance were designed to be administered at the state level, which in the South generally meant administration by whites for the benefit of whites. And that's a legacy that has persisted over 80 plus years now. You will have noted that even today the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, uh, is designed and administered at the state level. 
with rather different levels uh, of generosity in different states. So again, uh, there may be circumstances in which an upsurge of populist sentiment can have uh, positive effects on economic and, and political outcomes, but it seems to be difficult for mainstream politicians and parties to embrace the positive elements of that agenda without also paying obeisance to the negative aspects. So in answer to your question from a couple of months ago, Daniel, sometimes positive things can result from re revolts against the political establishment, but playing with populism, uh, I'm still inclined to conclude is playing with fire. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Barry, for this masterful uh, brief history of uh, populism, or two episodes of populism uh, in the United States. Now, we all know that you're also a student of European history. Is it possible to find similarly benign episodes in European history? I'm, I'm happy to open the floor to um, and anyone who wants to re re respond to that. I found it more difficult. Uh, if I'd been able to come up with good European examples, I would have offered them. And that brings us, if you want, to contemporary history. I mean, we all know the, the really excesses of uh, populism, especially in the 1930s in Europe. Uh, enough to think about uh, Germany, Italy, to some extent Spain. But even if you think about uh, populism more recently, uh, you outlined the economic grievances, uh, which one can understand, perhaps with the benefit of hindsight. But if I look at the populism today in Europe, and uh, if I want to refer just to the previous plenary which we had, uh, then it doesn't seem to me that uh, that populism was motivated by economic grievances, much less by some things which one could grasp and change and reform. So I do, um, I, 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 I think I would maintain that uh, in Europe as much as in the United States, there, there are, uh, there, there is a sense of ec economic insecurity that is every bit as important as uh, concerns about identity and uh, discomfort about over the perception that that uh, society is changing. So um, I think um, the economic concern in Europe today cent centers on insecurity. Um, will my children have a, a, a life as good as my own? It's not that the economy could be performing better to be sure but I think it's not so much, not simply poor performance of the economy, but this uncertainty about the future that uh, has developed against the backdrop of technical change, globalization, and all that. That actually was the topic of one of the sessions which we had. Uh, you were very careful, as usual, to say insecurity, not inequality. Uh, because if one looks at uh, the numbers for the continent, and you have done that also, I presume, there's not much of a tendency of higher inequality. Now, when you say insecurity, that could have uh, two aspects, some of which conflict with something which we want to have. Let me try to distinguish between the two. One is an economy which grows less strongly. It's obvious on average my children are less likely to have a much better life than I have if just the, the pie or the pie per head is not growing as vigorously as it did before. And actually on a per capita basis, things have not deteriorated that much in Europe. Right? The second point, and that is uh, something which is, I find a bit of paradox. Uh, people talk a lot about a missing uh, equality of opportunity. Um, 
you know, there are these studies which show that somebody born into the, let's say, last quintile, how likely is uh, he or she to be then uh, uh, rise up? Um, and we, we all agree that in principle we would like to have a society where that, uh, that the influence of birth is as, as little as possible. But it is just whatever, by adding up constraint, um, if those at the bottom have a right chance to rise up, so those at the top have a higher statistical chance to fall. Now, when you say higher insecurity, did you mean that we have actually more mobility? In a certain sense, more mobility upwards by some, and then of course, we have to have also then some mobility relative at least uh, downwards? Or did you mean that uh, the overall growth rates have, have fallen? So in the United States, what has uh, historically made our, our relatively high level of inequality tolerable was a high level of, high degree of social mobility. So people who are uh, at the bottom of the ladder have some expectation that they can realistically lift themselves up by their bootstraps. I'm convinced by the um, body of research that we associate with Raj Chetty, although a lot of other people have contributed to that work as well, that in indicates that uh, social mobility variously measured and defined has been declining in the U.S., so maybe that's yet an another one of those stylized facts about what makes a monetary union work, work relatively well that we need to go back and uh, uh, revisit. Um, but no, I don't think that economic security and, and, and the degree of economic mobility are, are synonymous, I think. Um, when I think about the uh, political reper repercussions about economic insecurity, it's simply uncertainty about the future. As I said, if, the, if there's low mobility, then at least the upper classes can be certain that they stay there and uh, that should limit uh, the appeal of the populist revolt. Uh, let me see whether there are some questions in the, in the audience. Um, we have a walking microphone. I see two hands. Um, where's the microphone? It's over there, thank you. And then you will be the second one. Uh, course, please you. identify yourself. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Mohammed Rajai Barakat. I am a new Euro-Arab citizen. Uh, uh, you spoke about migration and economic uh, reason, mobility. Uh, don't you think that the main uh, cause of, the main, uh, of uh, populism is that there is a lack of information that we give to our populations here in Europe and also in the United States? When we speak about migration, we speak always about migration from the south to the north. And we never speak about the migration, uh, maybe somebody will call it uh, other thing, from the north to the south. The advantages that Europeans, Americans have in uh, Arab countries in Africa, uh, who is building all these beautiful buildings in uh, Emirates, who is building the infrastructure in Qatar for uh, football uh, competitions. Uh, I think, uh, Media and politicians are not giving informations, enough information to people, and for this they are, uh, we, we, we find this populism who is uprising now in, in Europe and uh, in USA. Who is benefiting from these illegals who are living here? If you take the bus from Brussels, from the center, to Brabant Wallon, to Waterloo, and to these uh, uh, rich, uh, towns or villages, you will find in the morning hundreds of illegals who are going to work in these areas. Where they are working? In? They are working in the beautiful villas who belongs to I don't know whom. And even in uh, restaurants and companies uh, in the United States and in Europe, uh, and even in uh, uh, Gulf Cooperation Council's countries, they are working for international companies who, uh, who benefit from that. I think we have to tell our populations the truth about all these things. Thank you very much. 
you're preaching to the converted because uh, you're, you're speaking to a, a room full of economists. I think the uh, evidence is clear that immigrants on average, whether documented or undocumented, contribute more to the FISC, to the budget, than they take from it. And uh, un unskilled immigration benefits the skilled for standard factor proportions uh, related logic. Um, the, I, I, I think you're posing the, the, the question you're implicitly posing is why these, uh, we have not been more effective at uh, disseminating these findings and, the, and these conclusions that people who make arguments that are not well informed by the evidence tend to dominate this public debate over immigration. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Frederik de Bakker. I work for Telefonica, which is a telecom company, although this is quite relevant for the question I will ask. Um, on, on your point, basically, if I understood well, was, well, uh, populist movements can have a positive effect if mainstream pro um, parties take on board some of the most more progressive of a, um, demands of those uh, movements. Um, and you said the root of the movements can be because of economic grievance, so they ask for redistribution, or it can be also more uh, has to do with identity and they ask for recognition. Although the examples you gave, if I understood well, in the um, populist revolt, if I recall the name, and the uh, New Deal, it basically was about taking um, economical reform in the programs. So my question is, how can today, <laughs> in the US and in Europe, mainstream parties identify those eventually legital, legitimate demands, economical ones, uh, because I think this is, I mean, the situation is quite different. I mean, it was quite obvious, uh, as you explained with the um, popular revolt, those demands are, I mean, having a competition policy is quite an obvious thing, uh, but, but, but I think today, I think for mainstream parties, it is a lot more difficult to identify what could be legitimate demands. So, so if your point of departure uh, is mine, which is that a sense, a pervasive sense of economic insecurity is part of what feeds discomfort with uh, the political status quo and, and breeds support for populist politicians, uh, it's time to st step back, it seems to me, and ask what has happened, what has been done in different European countries to the social safety net? And are there, there are cases where it has been rendered less comprehensive, less effective, where it doesn't uh, 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 effectively address the concerns of workers and households about, I don't know, the kind of, kinds of skills they will need to compete in a 21st century world. I do find it reveal, I, 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 I am impressed by studies of the United Kingdom that show that where austerity hit the, the hardest and where the National Ser Health Service was most adversely affected is where support for Brexit was greater, where there was, uh, uh, if I'm permitted to say, a mindless political reaction against the mainstream. Can I make one comment here? I mean, when you said competition policy seems to us something natural, income tax, natural, necessary, I presume at the time, and you as a student of history will be able to document that, competition policy was presumably the devil, <laughs> interference with free markets, I presume, and uh, the income tax was the death of incentives for the working, right? Maybe you can say a few words about how they were viewed at the time. As you describe them. So I think we, we have to be very careful in saying uh, uh, what we 50, 100 years later think is, uh, is useful, but that stood the test of time and uh, what were regarded as uh, interferences with the free market. If, if, if I may, let me add one more word, which is I'm always a little bit tongue-tied when the question comes, what should Europe do? Or what do we need to do at the European level to address these concerns? Because the, the situation obviously is so different in different European countries. Obvious, but still worth saying. Inequality is not as much of a problem in Europe as it is in the United States, except 
in the UK and other places where it is a problem. Economic growth is not the problem in Europe, except in places like Italy where it is. So, it, you know, it's worth um, reminding ourselves of that and, and maybe observing that what needs to be done can't be done at the European level, but if these are, are the concerns, needs to be done at the national level. There was a question over there. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Lina Vosiluta and I work as a research fellow at SEPS. And my question would be um, about the links between hate politics and the populism. Because uh, we, see, we can see, especially uh, from your presentation, that populism was started by the interest groups who advocated for themselves, like farmers fighting for their rights for, to sell their production on better terms and so on. However, at this moment, we have billionaires masquerading and speaking as if they were farmers and selling, uh, selling everything that farmers do not like and mobilizing against those people, uh, be they Muslim, be they women, be they uh, blacks, and so on. And we see same kind of politics in, in Britain, in, if we speak about mobilizations around Brexit, it was also kind of this hate politics going on. The France, Le Pen, Italy, Salvini, and so on. We, we see same kind of recurrent issues. Hungary, to mention Poland, uh, where the establishments are portraying themselves as going back and being kind of pro-people, pro anti-establishment, and kind of mixing uh, of being um, yeah, representatives of the people when in fact they sometimes are very much capitalizing on this and, and addressing their own agendas. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not sure what to add to that. Um, I do, you know, I do think um, uh, the institutions of the European Union have a problem in that they are by their nature a, a, a rich target for populist uh, politicians. They, uh, you know, the commission is, is an institution of technocrats with university de degrees, members of the elite. Uh, the, uh, uh, the institutions of the European Union are perceived as out of touch with the people and, and you know, the commission and other EU institutions by construction are dominated by foreigners, whatever, uh, country you come from. So, you know, and, and the EU was created at the outset in response to uh, the more destructive aspects of, of nationalism in Europe. So this, you know, conflict between the people and parties and movements you describe and, and, and the EU is quite a natural thing and it points to the question, I don't have a simple answer to this, how can the institutions uh, uh, of the EU communicate their intentions and, 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 and policies in a, in a more effective way as a way of pushing back against those movements. The microphone has wandered over there. Okay, we'll have to take one there and then we have to go back there. Yeah. David Clark, retired EU official. The 1890s were a period of global economic downturn, I believe. At least my grandfather went past in Australia. Um, do you, do you see a correlation between the empire preference movement in the UK of Joe Chamberlain and the economic downturn of the 1890s? And can we, I mean, you talked about the 1930s, um, and you talked about the effect of austerity in the UK on nationalism. I, I mean, we had a global downturn as a result of the economic crisis, of two, financial crisis of 2008. I mean, do you clear, see a clear link between that and the rise of populism today, and again, back, perhaps back in the 1890s. So certainly, um, the financial crisis of 1893 and the financial crisis of 2008 were provided fuel for these populist movements. There were, was, in both cases, the feeling that the financiers had avoided the worst consequences of the events that they had fomented, and, and, and that the people in quotes for the cost. So yes, I do think there is uh, a, a straight line from financial crisis to uh, uh, populist sentiment. Um, uh, Morris Schularek, uh, uh, Alan Taylor and co-authors have 
looked at that uh, more systematically over time and across a, a larger sample of countries, and they do see that connection between um, uh, financial crisis and right-wing extremism in particular. I think the other thing I would, would say is that um, containing populist movements sometimes uh, uh, involves an element of good luck, that uh, the 1890s was also a period of great gold discoveries in Siberia and Western Australia and elsewhere, and the price level started rising, the problem of deflation went away, economic growth uh, accelerated. In uh, the U.S. economy expanded by 10% um, a year between 1933 and 1940, if you ignore the double-dip recession of 1936-37. So this was a vigorous recovery by our 21st century standards. And, and, and again, uh, I, I, I think that's one of the things that enabled the political center to hold. And one problem we face with this, if you want, economic explanation in Europe is, and again, we had the illustration in the plenary, that two of the countries we most accuse of populism are Poland and Hungary, where there was uh, no financial crisis, where actually growth is pretty good, where the parents can be almost certain that their kids will have a better life, and still. So is that something else? So I can't claim to um, understand well the Eastern European, Central European um, brand of populism. I think the um, generations of school children in, in Western Europe were uh, taught a curriculum that emphasized uh, the dangers of nationalism for 30 or 40 years after World War II. And countries in, in Central and Eastern Europe had a holiday from that, those teachings until after 1989. That may be part of it as well. It's not all economics. And also, another aspect of that is that uh, we had uh, last year here on this podium Ivan Krastev, and his uh, working hypothesis was that uh, at least in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, populism is linked to emigration, the feeling of being left behind, which is uh, not the same thing as being not doing well economically, uh, but uh, we have this feeling very strongly, of course, in countries like Romania, which have lost 20% uh, of the working age population. So uh, I was actually wondering whether in the United States, uh, where sometimes one speaks about the rural city, where the emigration from the rural areas, whether that had a similar impact. So, um, it's it, certainly the case that in, in the United States, people talk with some justification about the left behind, uh, uh, constituting the, the core of Trump's base and uh, being left behind is associated with a, a certain level of skill and therefore adaptability, but it's also associated with location as you well, and, and by, by which people have meant the Rust Belt and, 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 and parts of the country with declining populations. On, on the immigration side, um, you see both in the U.S. and, and, and in the U.K. that uh, the backlash has been concentrated not in areas with the most immigrants, but in the areas with the least, where the least is known about uh, who the immigrants are, what they do, what they will contribute to the economy. Massimo Bordignon from the Catholic University of Milan, so from Italy. No. I'm curious if it probably is linked somehow to the things that we have been discussing before. I would like to raise the issue of the relationship between populism and the selection of the political class. The selection of the political class, because uh, one of the things that uh, one positive thing one can say in favor of, of uh, populism, probably you somehow anticipated that, that uh, if you have an elite which does not work any longer, maybe there may be a substitution of elite. But one of the characteristics now of uh, the new populist movement is that exactly because they are proposing themselves as against the, the, the elite, and the elite is competent as technological uh, knowledge or whatever, 
you are producing a very low quality uh, politician. And in a sense, for example, this is one of the things which worry me most in Italy at the moment, more than uh, the policy that they are doing. So, you know, do you have experience like that uh, in the US? What do you think about that? Uh, a two-word two answer would be Donald Trump. Yes, we do have experience with that in the United States. And, and we are all at, at sea about what exactly to do about it. Okay, I want to take a, a question here, please, in the second row. And then I go over there and then over there back. Thanks. Ian Begg from the London School of Economics. You, you challenged us to identify European positive instances. In, in trying to answer that, I wonder if the division between populists and non-populists is clear-cut enough to, to enable us to pick examples. So I've tried to, to jot down some potential options. I started with disruptors. Maybe a class of populists, maybe not. Is Macron when he started out, certainly a disruptor, but is he a populist? Was Schroeder, when he initiated change in Germany, disrupting? Thatcher, when she launched her, her uh, assault on established uh, ways of doing things in the UK. And then you have a different sort, potentially, challengers, like uh, ideological challengers, like Syriza in, in Greece, maybe with a positive outcome. The, the left coalition in Portugal, maybe with a positive outcome. And then my third suggestion for a class of populists, and this is maybe a bit insulting, is to refer to them as panderers, those who pander to the, their, their interest. And I'm possibly thinking here of Berlusconi or Babish in the Czech Republic. I wonder if you have any comment on my suggested typology. So the um, typology was disruptors, panderers, and ideological... Uh, challengers. Um, do I have any comments? Um, you know, as I was thinking about uh, Daniel's earlier question, I think we could we could go back in in European history further. Um, maybe my uh, uh, a case in point that I do talk in my, uh, about in my book would be Bismarck, whose um, social policy reforms, social insurance reforms, were in, in tended to head off what he saw as more radical, uh, disruptive socialist tendencies in European society. I mean, when you were talking about populists giving that definition, um, I was thinking actually that this is somewhat different from the definition which I would give and which I think many people would agree is the, the dangerous part of it which is that uh, my definition would be that populism means that uh, the people, uh, meaning the majority, has an absolute untrampled right. And that uh, constitutional constraints uh, are not legitimate if they stand in the way of, quote-unquote, the will of the people. And uh, that is, of course, particularly important for Europe, because the European Union is the embodiment of the protection of, uh, of uh, minorities and the embodiment of the restriction of the sovereignty and the power of the people to decide. Uh, and uh, when you were speaking, I was asking myself, uh, now in the United States, was that part of the populist movement that they didn't accept the constitutional rules, the checks and balances as legitimate? Or do they want it just to reform then? And that comes back to your question, Ian. That uh, I would say that everybody who says we accept that the will of the people has to be constrained by constitutions, by democratic norms, that there is a protection of minorities, but we have a political goal which we want to achieve. That, for me, would be very different from saying we do not accept these restrictions. And in the U.S., I don't know how it was in the two episodes that you mentioned. I would have to think a little bit more, but I, 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 I think what you're um, uh, suggesting is accurate, that there wasn't a desire to uh, 
significantly weaken or uh, abrogate the checks and balances uh, uh, division of authority that characterized uh, American government then. But that, in, in a sense, this is, uh, in my view, very much at risk now when um, uh, uh, policy can be made by president, presidential declaration rather than uh, with the consent of the Congress. There was a question over there. Ah, okay, then it was misunderstood your hand. Then we go over there in the back. Thank you. Andreas Backhaus from SEPS. Um, thank you for the, your presentation, Professor. Um, suppose immigration to the US through the southern border is going down and data suggests it is indeed going down. Then who will be the main beneficiaries of this policy? Clearly, there will be losers in terms of immigrants from Latin America who do not reach the US, but benefits will accrue to probably low skilled native US Americans and low-skilled immigrants from Latin America who've recently arrived in the US because they will face lower labor market competition as a result of um, decreased immigration. Would this trade-off, in your view, qualify as an unintended positive consequence of populist policies? Thank you. Would it, would, uh, first question would be, would it, would it follow as a consequence? And, and the second one, I suppose, would be, if it does, should we consider it uh, to be a positive? So I'll, I'll leave the second uh, normative judgment to you. Uh, on, on the first question, again, I think there ha is now uh, an immensely large literature on uh, the impact of, of immigration on uh, various socioeconomic groups. There is less than 100% agreement here. Economists are famous for making the most of our disagreements. But I think there is broad agreement on the basis of, uh, of the evidence uh, in the literature um, from natural experiments like the Mariel boat lift from Cuba to Florida, um, the vast majority of which suggests that the immigration your example of um, uh, less skilled individuals from Latin America, the impact of that on less skilled uh, individuals in the receiving communities in, in, in the United States is small, relatively minor. So I think the, the way you posed the question may have suggested that what is in fact a, a relatively small impact is much larger. Now, what I find interesting is also that the, um, if you want, the identity reaction um, is strikingly different across countries. Um, if you take uh, the east-west migration in the EU, uh, which has been uh, undoubtedly rather large, uh, at least for European standards, if you look at, I'm saying, no, the continent, um, there has been remarkably little reaction to it. Um, not in Germany, well, it's coming later in Germany than the UK. Um, it's coming later, it was prevalent in Spain, and then there was a bus, so it, it went back. But what strikes me is that uh, within the, at least the continental European countries, there was always a distinction between uh, intra-European migration and from the rest of the world. And the reaction was mostly against the rest of the world. Um, and there was perception that these were welfare migrants or they were from different culture. Whereas in the UK, it seems almost the opposite. That there's almost more uh, ressentiment against the, uh, the immigration from Eastern Europe, which after all is culturally very similar, assimilates rather quickly, uh, may even be temporary, so what makes for this very different, if you want, elasticity of the popular reaction uh, to uh, flows which to an economist look very similar in the sense that, okay, low wage immigrants um, and they should have similar economic consequences in both uh, cases. 
but lead to very dissimilar political consequences? I, I, I wish I had a good answer to that. I, I, again, I think we should um, temper your question, though, before uh, proceeding. If you look a little bit back in, in British history, uh, there, there was quite a vicious reaction against immigration from the empire in the 1960s, in the early 1970s. So the, you know, uh, pref uh, attitudes toward different immigrant groups that you perceive existing today uh, have not all, always existed in the UK. So we would also have to understand how and why that changed. But these things can change over time, apparently. There was a question over there. Uh, hello, my name is Anastasia Deligiori from Dublin City University. Thank you very much for the very interesting lecture. My question refers to uh, populism and the so-called misinformation in post-truth era, which is very much related in literature with the rise of populism. So I would like to ask what's your opinion in this kind of communication environment that might have helped work. Uh, and especially in social media, this widespread of uh, populism and whether if we have a more improved and well-versed people in terms of what they know can help us address this kind of uh, populism that we have seen the last years. Thank you. Mm. So, um, when I was um, ruminating in my lecture about the advantages uh, uh, of representative democracy relative to direct democracy. Uh, the the, the trade-off I referred to was that in, in um, representative democracy, there is a, a principal agent problem between uh, the voter and, and, and the people who go off to Brussels or whomever, wh wherever to sit in the parliament. Direct democracy, on the other hand, suffers from the pro problem that the voters are not always well informed if they're asked uh, to themselves make decisions. So what can we do to make for better informed voters? Uh, I, I, I do think we're, we're in a very difficult transition period now where the gatekeepers help to an extent with that when we, we relied on, on old media and now there are no gatekeepers anymore. Maybe you're better off, you're, you're further along in uh, Europe than we are in the United States toward thinking about how to regulate and, uh, and, and create mechanisms to distinguish news from fake news on, on new media, but I think we're all very far from, from being there. Actually, when I, when I hear you discussing about this, I was just thinking that if you take uh, levels of education today compared to the episodes you're talking about, much, much higher today. Uh, we have now a 30% graduation rate, tertiary uh, graduation rate, whereas perhaps we had 30%, I don't know, secondary at most. Um, so it seems to me that uh, we get rising fake news with rising education levels. Um, and then we say more education should help us against, inoculate against fake news. Uh, so it doesn't seem to me that, at least historically, there's any correlation between the level of education and the, the virulence with which uh, populism can take uh, roots. So um, no matter uh, how deeply invested I am in, in the merits of university education, um, what, what you're saying is that it, it doesn't inoculate people against misinformation, and, and we all know that to be the case. Over there, I now have difficulty seeing. I think first we have to I'll take the person in the last row and then here. Uh, Michael Grubb from UCL. Uh, I think there are two quite simple answers to your previous question, Daniel, about the reactions in Britain. Uh, and the first is, is the speed and focus. Um, absolutely, in the 1960s, there were very much reactions against Commonwealth immigration that dissipated over probably three decades, and then there was a abrupt and sudden influx of Eastern European uh, immigrants uh, to regions that hadn't been used to that. But the second thing was, it was easy to blame another political entity, i.e. the EU, 
for that occurrence rather than fighting against our own government's decision lobbied by industries to say we need cheap Commonwealth workers. Um, so I think there are two very clear explanations there that have nothing to do with racism or anything. Um, but there's one other element which slightly flows from this as well. I've been a little surprised at the lack of potential debatable reference to economic ideology and in particular the sense to which market ideology got such a fundamental uh, hold and focus upon the aggregate benefits as opposed to the distributional consequences because uh, it seems to me that has also been a feature of the last uh, decade or so uh, which obviously has come home to roost with the financial crisis that adds layers of sense of unfairness and the elite finances getting away etc. Yeah, I, I, I think we as, as, an, as a profession, economists, need to reflect more on how it was we forgot the Stover Samuelson theorem for several decades, that the, uh, the, the period of high globalization from China's admission to the, the World Trade or Organization until a couple of years ago, it should have been clear to all of us that uh, free trade and globalization does not automatically raise all boats but there were not a lot of people out there actively reminding policymakers of that fact. I believe there was one question here in the third row. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Luis Cano. I am from Momentum Mosgalom, a local political party in Hungary. And one of the questions that I have is, actually, I do agree with the fact that the populist rhetoric in Hungary at the moment is being bought by an older generation that feels insecurity about the migration crisis and about all this multiculturalism that is brought to the country, yet the rhetoric about uh, insecurities, economic insecurities for my generation, which is uh, young professionals around 30, 40 years old, it has created actually, those insecurities have created more apathy, so more I want to get aside from uh, the politics, there is a deception, there is no more trust in the institutions, and then we wonder many times, how do we approach uh, and then address these insecurities without falling into a populist rhetoric? And then uh, do you see somehow uh, a way for us to escape that path of populism uh, and address those uh, insecurities of these people who have decided to be silent in the political arena? So as I said before, every um, European case is different and it's hard to generalize, but as you were describing the age insecurity gradient in Hungary, I was thinking about the age insecurity and leave gradient in the UK, which shows very much the same pattern. Okay, I think we have come uh, to the end of today. Let me just uh, end with one uh, challenge. <laughs> And the subtitle of your book was Economic Grievances. So my question is, in Europe today, East and West, would you still maintain that economic grievances are one major factor? And if yes, what can be done about it at the EU level as opposed to the national level? Yes, I would maintain that uh economic insecurity is a powerful factor. Um, uh, lending support to uh, what we've been referring to as, as populist movements. What, what can be done about that sense of in, in insecurity? You can uh, uh, help people acquire the skills and training they need to navigate a more volatile economic world, so here I am an educator talking about the advantages of, of investing in education and training. Um, and, and I think the discussion we were having before about the need for uh, uh, an, an efficient but, but comprehensive safety net is part of it as well. Okay, let us conclude on this constructive note. Many thanks, Barry, and let's hope we can uh, withstand this populist wave uh, in about, what is it, uh, two or three months when the real election happens. Thank you very much.